Space Student Association. And today we are here with Andrew from Cycling Scotland to learn more about tips and tricks on how to cycle safely on the roads of Aberdeen. Keep watching to learn more about what you can do and how you can change your behaviours on the road. So, I'm Andrew from Cycling Scotland. I'm uh, going to deliver uh, effectively an essential cycling skills course. We've branded this one as Cycle Awareness Training for Learner Drivers. But it's about a half an hour theory of how we manage to ride on the road safely. So if we look at the first line, just taken from the Highway Code, you may be familiar with it. Um, it's the rule about overtaking vulnerable road users, people it's easy to hurt, people on bikes, pedestrians, people on horses. The wording says, give them as much space as you would a car. Well, that's ambiguous, because some people overtake a car and give it that much space. So they put the photograph in to make the point that what they meant was, imagine there's a car there and overtake the imaginary car. Crossing over the centre line, using the other side of the road. Or as my driving instructor memory said, imagine the cyclist falls over, don't run over their head. So, if we now look at the cyclist, this is the Department for Transport. They set this up. How close do we think they've got the cyclist to the kerb. The kerb rather than the edge of carriageway marker. And if you look at that, it's probably about a metre, three feet, a yard, and that's the closest you want to be to the kerb. Lots of reasons why you want that space there. There are drains. If you're lucky they're laid with the bars across, if you're unlucky they're laid with the bars laid up, your wheel goes into it, your air ball. In urban areas it's where all the broken glass are, and th in rural areas it's where all the thorns end up. Um, it gives you uh, space there so that you're not likely to strike your pedal against the kerb, which will put you down on the ground. It keeps you further away from pedestrians, who some people only look up when they hear something. On a bike, you're pretty much silent, so it gives you space between the um, pedestrian and yourself. But the most important reason, if we go back to the passing, passing car, is that gives you a metre safety space that you can move into if you need it. So say maybe 999 drivers of 1,000 are, are over there, they've crossed over the centre line, and one driver in 1,000 is overtaking on your elbow. So every time you hear somebody coming up behind you, check behind to see where they are. You're riding along, check behind. Next one, check behind. You hear somebody else, check behind. So that's a massively useful skill to practice if you've not been on a bike for a while. Make sure you can look behind without veering all over the road. Go and find a car park that's empty or a playground or somewhere quiet to practice that skill, really useful. And every time you hear somebody up, check behind. The time you check behind and they're on your elbow, then you move over into that gap, let them by, and check and move back out again. So, if we've got the motor vehicles crossing over to that side of the road, if there's lots of oncoming traffic, they can't overtake. They'll need to wait behind and be patient. So you can get the situation that if there's lots of traffic coming, you end up with a queue of vehicles. And the highway code there says if, there's, if you're in a slow moving vehicle and there's a long queue of traffic, now it doesn't say what long is, that could be length of time or number of vehicles, it's a judgment you have to make. But if you're in a slow moving vehicle and there's a long queue of vehicles, when it's safe, pull in and allow the traffic to go by. So if you're in a group of cyclists, um, the highway code says uh, you should not ride more than two abreast. Two is absolutely fine. Maybe you had a group of eight, if you're two by two, you've now reduced the length of time that the vehicle's got to be the other side of the road. So, although many people think that cyclists might be being arrogant and getting in the way, they're actually making the group smaller and making it easier to overtake. But again, if you've got a long queue behind you, when it's safe, pull in. Now, it could be it's going to take a while to find somewhere safe to get a group of eight in, get them out of the way, get the traffic by, check it's clear and move back out again. So it's when it's safe. So we're moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> In terms of vulnerable road users, of course, it's not just people on bikes. There's a, a rural road here uh, in Stirling. connects a couple of paths, frequently used by joggers, um, dog walkers. And there's a, a lady there in a purple top with a wee white dog. So if you're driving, you need to give her that space of a, an imaginary car, and you can't do that on a corner, so you'd need to wait until it's safe to overtake. This is a very common feature, traffic island, there to make life easier for pedestrians, and I'm all for making life easier for pedestrians. But there's not space between the kerb and that traffic island for somebody to overtake 
and give the person on the bike the space we saw in that first slide. The traffic island gets in the way. Hence, and if you can read that, it says, caution, do not overtake cyclists at the islands. Now there are thousands of these traffic islands, but there's only two places in Scotland I'm aware of that sign. One is by the Forth Bridge, you can see the girders there, and the other's down by Musselburgh Racecourse. The guidance for cyclists, and I was talking to a highways engineer who was putting in some of these near where I live, and he said it's the responsibility of the cyclists to position themselves in such a way as to discourage people from overtaking. Or in other words, rather than riding a metre out, ride in the centre of the lane, not the middle of the road, but the centre of the lane, to close the door and discourage people overtaking where it's not safe to do. Now obviously you don't want to see the traffic island there and just move out to the centre of the lane. It's a matter of seeing the traffic island coming, looking behind, if somebody's about to overtake, let them go, doing a massive signal, hands back on the bars, checking that people respond to that, and then moving out to the centre of the lane, through the centre of the lane, and then check on your left and move back over. Now that's relatively straightforward if you're a relatively fast cyclist and it's a relatively low speed limit. So in a 20 mile an hour speed limit, it's fairly straightforward. Downhill, 30 mile an hour speed limit, relatively straightforward. You get to the point where it's in a 40, 50, 60 mile an hour speed limit, you just can't get out into the traffic flow. And in that situation, the top tip is bail out. Stop, but don't get yourself sandwiched between the traffic island and the curb. If there's a blue circular sign uh, on the lamppost with a picture of a bike and a pedestrian, then it's legal to ride on the pavement, technically the footway beside the road. If there isn't, to be legal, you'd need to get off and push your bike. And if there is the blue circular sign and you're riding down and there's a couple of pedestrians there, then you need to let them know you're coming. You could ring your bell if you've got one, but a lot of pedestrians get quite crabby if you do that. So a friendlier way is just to say, hello, excuse me, nice dog, assuming they've got a dog. Um, but if they're deaf, or if they don't get out of your way, you need to wait. In exactly the same way that we said, if the car can't give that space, the driver needs to wait. It's the same if you're sharing space with pedestrians and there isn't space, you need to wait. Now in Scotland, any path that goes away from a road, it's perfectly legal to walk on it, ride your bike on it, ride your horse on it. If it floods, you can paddle your canoe, as long as you're not using an engine. Thanks to the Land Reform Scotland Act in Scotland, we can share space with pedestrians on paths away from a road. But if it's next to a road, then you have to have the magic blue sign. And just to confirm that this concept of riding central when it's narrow, it's not just some cycle trainer saying this. This is Department for Transport Think Road Safety campaign. Cyclists ride central on narrow roads. Close the door on the dangerous overtake. If it's not safe to let somebody overtake, position yourself to discourage it. Now I've got a wee video. So if you watch this, um, you can see at the start that the cyclist's about a metre out. It's keeping out the puddles, that's always a good idea, not to stay dry, but you don't know how deep that is. Is it a couple of millimetres or is it four inches? So don't ride in puddles, it's something else that can put you down on the ground uh, at a moment's notice. So while watching this, have a think about when did you first see the traffic island and then we can think about what the driver could have done differently and what the cyclist could have done differently. The cyclists look round, now they look down. There goes the wagon, there's the traffic island. The cyclists look round. The wagon's actually not going much faster than the cyclists, so that overtake really achieved nothing. Now the wagon's turning off. And nice positioning from the cyclist to keep away from the parked car. So by the end of the overtake, if you look, you look carefully, you can see the cyclist has used that metre gap, they've moved in, they're right by the kerb. The wagon though is right on their elbow, if you watch it locks, they're on the brake, they're moving in. What could they have done differently? I suspect if they'd looked back earlier and seen the wagon coming, they could have started planning what they were going to do. They could have either bailed out earlier, sometimes it can be useful even if you can't move out to the centre of the lane, just signalling is enough to make drivers go, what's going on here, and back off. Sometimes pointing at the hazard, because some people in motor vehicles are looking no further than the thing that's immediately in front of them, and that's you. If you're pointing further up the road, they learn, look up, see the traffic on, and go, whoa, and back off. If they still keep going, though, uh, start scanning and looking for drop curbs, because that's the easiest way to bail out. So I think the cyclists could have been looking further up the road and dealing with that sooner. And I think the driver, if they'd been looking further up the road, 
may well have seen the traffic island and backed off as well. So I think there's something there about both of them looking further up the road. Oops. So we've now got an awareness test. So watch the video and work out how many passes the team in white make. If you got 13, you were correct. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So we'll rewind. And there it goes. And the tagline from this is it's easy to miss something you're not looking for. So look for cyclists. There was a, um, a blog written by an RAF um, pilot um, and he's involved in training and he's also a cycle trainer, I believe. And he said that they train pilots to look really carefully. And the top tips they give, which are useful for drivers and cyclists, is one, don't glance, use both eyes. Two, um, train people to look Far, medium, near, far, medium, near, and then you're far more likely to see what's there. Um, and the last thing, top tip in terms of looking and being seen, is if you're a cyclist and it's a bright day, think very carefully about what you're wearing. Because if there's low sun and you're wearing all yellow or all something bright, you can blend into that background. There's a lot of road safety messages out there. Be bright, be seen are overly simplistic. It would make more sense to say, contrast with your background, be seen. So think more deeply about what you're wearing than sim overly simplistic messages. Now, when you're cycling, it's also good to be aware of your surroundings. Going past parked cars, you need to be far enough away that if a door opens, it won't hit you. And so check behind whenever you hear somebody coming up. Now, they've just stopped, they like to open the door, so if you're going by, I'd go by with more space. Here we've got side roads here, we've got somebody here pulling out, so again, whenever you're going past park vehicles, expect them to move out. Got somebody here, and to be far away from there. Now, they're clearly impatient, so I'd be tempted at this point to back off, because I'd rather have impatient people in front of me than behind me and I don't want to squeeze them between me and the parked cars. When riding in traffic, it's best to have a bit of space because people can make very sharp braking and turning. Give them space. You'll be checking the side roads, and again, they're impatient, so now expect them to continue being impatient. You need to be far enough to be, ah, here's the car door, far enough away from that. So again, get out to block the traffic behind you. Check it's clear on the right and then eyeball the people on the left and be ready to go behind them when they pull out. Next video clip. Try and pause this one. Okay. So what are you going to do here on a bike? You're going around here, you've got somebody coming up here. Judging the speed they're going, start making a, a judgment call about do you think they're going to stop or not. Um, quite often windscreens are obscured by glare, but if you realise they're just looking at the side road, that's warning bells to me that they're, they might not have seen you. So I'm starting to think, if they pull out, can I? I don't want to go straight on, but that's my plan B. Or am I ready for my emergency stop? Or can I slot in behind them? There we go, slotting in behind them work there. Now if we look at this cyclist, nicely positioned in the centre of the lane, side road here. So again, being ready for your emergency stop, arms braced, weight backwards, 
and that will give you the most effective stop. And if your arms are braced and your weight's backward, there's no chance of going over, or less chance of going over the handle bars. This um, is best practice. We've got a cycle lane here, and there's a hashed area to keep cyclists away from uh, the doors as they open. Um, drivers should check before opening doors. Um, there's uh, a manoeuvre called Dutch Reach, which uh, I believe is going to the next edition of the Highway Code. So rather than opening a door with the hand that's nearest the door, reach with the hand that's furthest away it means you're looking back down the road towards uh, cyclists that are coming. But cyclists, we train them to keep away, so even if a door opens, you won't get hit. And this is best practice, the hashed area to keep people on bikes away from the door danger zone. And again, Department for Transport, road safety campaign, advising cyclists, keep a door's width from the parked cars and drivers don't open the door if there's somebody on a bike coming. This next photograph is taken a bit further down the road. We've now got the cycle lane without the hashed area. So the cycle lane is the door danger zone. Don't ride in the door danger zone. Just because a highways officer has painted a cycle lane somewhere, it doesn't mean it's the safest place for you to be. The highway code says cycle lanes are there to make your journey safer. Use of them will depend upon your confidence and experience. If it gets to say, they may make your journey less safe depending upon where they've been painted. So in this situation, do not ride in the door danger zone. So the safest place to ride is therefore going to be over in the rest of the traffic lane. You don't want to ride on the line here because you can see the size of that wagon. There isn't room for somebody to overtake you safely and give you the space we saw in that first highway code picture. So it's centre of the lane to discourage people from overtaking you. So you're now riding down here in the centre of the lane. There's what appears to be a cycle lane to your left. You may well find the drivers behind you are getting frustrated and annoyed. Now, if they're leaning on their horns and screaming and shouting, that's their problem. We need to remember is because they're getting angry and stressed, you don't need to. They're the ones who are going to die stress-related illnesses in their 30s because they can't cope with somebody riding a bike. But if they end up a couple of inches from your back wheel and you think, now that's endangering me, talk to me, pull in, stop, get rid of them, take a deep breath, <coughs> check it's clear, and once it's clear, carry on. But don't let them bully you into riding in the door danger zone. And when you stop, ideally stop between the bonnet and the boot, so if a door opens, it won't get you. Now, in my experience, people are angry and no place to learn, so there's probably not a lot of point at that point in trying to engage with them and explain what you're doing. And also, you've got no idea who they are. They could have been released from jail the day before after serving 20 years from an unspeakable act of violence, and you're the first person to annoy them. Get rid of them, deep breath, <sighs> check it's clear, and carry on with your life. This uh, was taken uh, at a cycle show. The, um, Police have got a stand, they've got in one of these big quarry lorries, they're explaining to cyclists this area in black with the yellow around it. Um, effectively, that's a blind spot, it's really difficult for the driver to see, especially if the mirrors aren't adjusted properly or they're dirty. Uh, don't go into that area, there's a good chance the driver can't see. Now that also maps perfectly over a, a zebra crossing. So, if you're a pedestrian and you're waiting here and the wagon comes up and stops, great, you know the, the, the driver's seen you because he's stopped. But if you're coming up the pavement and this side, the driver probably can't see you. If he's waiting for somebody there and they've started walking, it may be that as you step in front, they roll forward because they have no idea you are there. So it might be a matter of walking forward, making eye contact with the driver, checking they see you, and then walking in front. Ideally, it'd be nice if drive stopped further back so their blind spot didn't go over the crossing, but that doesn't always happen. So, top tip. Don't go into that area. Now the next slide. This is uh, advanced stop line at traffic lights. It makes a cycle box there. There's a handy cycle lane that feeds into it. The idea that the cyclists are there. At the front it's easier for people in motor vehicles to see them and they get through the junction first. The only downside is it's exactly the same size and shape as the blind spot on large vehicles. So, if you get there before the vehicles, fine. But if there's a long queue of vehicles at traffic lights, that's telling you the lights have been red for a while. After they've been red for a while, they go green. There is no way I want to start cycling up a long queue of vehicles when there's a good chance they're going to start moving. They don't know I'm there. The lights change. I haven't got to the front yet. They start turning. 
moving forward and turning, if they turn across me, it's not a good place to be. So if I'm coming up and there's a large queue of traffic there, I'm more likely to wait behind that red van at the back, not in the cycle lane because I don't want somebody else coming up and putting me in the blind spot, behind that red van, behind the number plate between the brake lights and then roll forward in the traffic queue when the lights change. If I knew the road network really well, knew how the lights worked, I might be tempted to filter up on the outside. It's perfectly legal, the highway code says um, to drivers, in slow moving or stationary traffic, look out for bikes and motorcycles that are filtering and give them space to do so. Not only is it legal, the highway code recommends that drivers facilitate it. However, uh, it is high risk, it, you do need to keep your wits about you, um, and some drivers think that you're being a naughty cyclist and may well try to block you off, so do watch out for that. But that can be a perfectly useful way of getting to the front that doesn't put you up the blind spot. So use of these um, can be helpful, but can put you in a really nasty place. This design has caused so many problems that um, certainly in London and now in Edinburgh and Glasgow, they're putting in a second set of lights with bike symbols. So that they go green first, that gets the cyclists through the junction and then the motor vehicles go. It's going to take a long time though for all junctions to be retrofitted like that. So be very careful when you're using these. Next slide, we've now got an articulated lorry. The cab started turning, the mirrors are pointing at the trailer. None of those people on bikes can be seen from the driver in the cab. Two ways they can have got there. One, the wagon was there first, they've ridden up inside. Do not do that. Don't even do that in a small car. These big wagons quite often move to the right to give them space to move left. So don't drive if you fit 500 or your smart car in there, and certainly don't drive up right up there on your bike. The other possibility, of course, is the cyclists were there first and the wagons come up and put them into the blind spot, which is why we recommend you don't stop in the, in the gutter, but you stop in the centre of the lane. Same theory as for the traffic on and stop in the centre of the lane to encourage people to wait behind you. You check it's clear, you go through the junction, the next person checks it clear, they go through the junction, we've got people going through a junction one at a time the way it's designed to be used. But if it's all gone pear-shaped and you're the cyclist in green and you're there and the wagon's there, don't hang around. Don't try and make eye contact with the driver, bail out onto the pavement, just go out of the way because those back wheels are going to be over you in a couple of seconds. And if the highway authority have put those metal railings around to keep pedestrians out of the road, ditch the bike, jump over the railings. You probably haven't got time to start trying to clamber over with your bike. Ditch the bike, get over the railings. The bike will get trashed, but you and the driver will still both be around to argue about who's paying for the meal. Got another video here. This cyclist on a recumbent bike's where you can see their feet. We'll look at their positioning. They're coming up to a queue of traffic, and there they are. They're in that centre of the lane, technical terms, primary position, between the brake lights, and then we've got this guy who is going up on the inside. At this point, this guy's saying, no, stop, don't do it. Okay, how close the back wheel is to the cyclist. So that's not a good idea. Don't do that. Don't go up inside these long, large vehicles. Uh, it may well not end well. Now, this cyclist, rather than being sent to the lane, now he's slightly to the right, so the driver's got a chance of seeing him in his mirrors, advanced positioning, and that guy's a Darwin Award. So... Yeah, good positioning here, chance of the uh, driver to see him in the mirror. Got to be careful you don't open up a space there that somebody in a Fiat 500 or a smart car is going to go into there. So check behind and see who's behind you. If you think there's a risk they're going to come in here and take your pack, then stay central. If you're happy that you can move there without that happening, then it gives the driver a chance. But don't be like that guy. Don't go up inside these big vehicles. Couple more videos. This one, the cyclist's got two cameras. One pointing forward, one pointing backwards. This is the rear view. They're in the advanced stop box. The lights change, they move off. Now, this is in London, where the super cycle highways are painted blue. Initially, the cycle lane is in the bus lane. But the next junction, the bus lane is going to go left. The cycle route's going straight on, so the blue paint is going to change from the bus lane to the going straight on lane. So people on bikes need to look behind, look for a gap in the traffic, signal if you need to move over into the lane there. Now we get the front view, there's a waste paper wagon here, and there's a lady in yellow here. She's going straight on, she's in the blue paint going straight on, and the wagon turns left. So let's watch the slow motion and see what happened there. So you can see the cyclist in yellow is at the front, here comes the wagon. 
Right, the brakes are on, the brakes are on. So they're slowing for the junction. Brakes are on, cyclists in the blue paint for going straight on. Brakes are on, brakes are on. Cyclist goes into the blind spot about now. Wagon signals left and turns left across. Excellent bike handling skills by the woman in yellow to avoid going into the wagon. Driver got points and fines for careless driving. So think about what the cyclist could have done differently. And I think she's been suckered in by the blue paint. Ideally, rather than being in the blue paint there at the side of that lane, she really wanted to be the centre of the lane to discourage somebody from overtaking her. But watching that lots of times, there isn't time to move out of the bus lane into the blue paint on the going straight on lane to move out of the blue paint to going straight on. She needed to get out there a lot earlier. So again, just because a highways officer has painted a cycle lane, blue paint, red paint, whatever your local authority does, it doesn't mean it's your safest option. Uh, there are times when you need to move out of there a lot earlier. Um, and it may well be, frankly, if that was my commute to work, I'd might well be doing some route planning and seeing is there another way I can go that doesn't mean I have to do that every month. There's some great cycle route planners, one I use a lot is cyclestreets.net. Check it out, it's a really good way of finding other ways of going places. But it could be there isn't another route, in which case don't get suckered by the blue paint. And in terms of the driver, it may well be there's something about route planning there as well. Um, did they know where they're going? Was it their mate saying, oh left here, and they just did a last minute left turn? But again, don't overtake people at junctions. Hang back, let them get through the junction, and then take the turn. So here we've got a very common thing. We've got a cycle lane, like that last one, that's in the bus lane. Let's have a look at what's happening here. So we've got the car come up here and is signalling left. Highway code says don't turn across bus lanes, cycle lanes or tramways without giving way to people already in it. So at this point the driver does wait and give way, the cyclist waves them over. The downside with the cyclist waving them over is there could have been another cyclist coming up behind and they've now waved that car across the cyclist who's coming past them. So best not to change priorities. If somebody's waited Thank you, and then carry on. Ideally, though, it would have been better if the driver had waited behind and not overtaken and waited. Just time it so that you come in behind the cyclist rather than overtaking. So that's covered by Highway Code Rules 182 and 183. And then finally, before moving off, again, whether you're on a bike or a car, don't just rely on mirrors, do a head check, see what's there, and don't move off until it's clear. So that's the end of the theory. Next thing, we'll go and check our bikes and then go for a ride.